On today's episode of Real Truth, we look at the grieving report concerning the SBC's mishandling of sexual abuse. This is a difficult issue, but how can we address it biblically? Also, we consider the continuing decline of a biblical worldview in the church. How can we protect ourselves from this trend or even correct it? Let's consider the truth about all of that up next. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. Before we get to our content for this video, I want to encourage you to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on notifications. If you like our videos, please visit our website to learn how you can donate. Let's start with a church react. This is the segment where I react to current happenings in the church. On Sunday, a third party investigative report by Guidepost was released detailing the mishandling of sexual abuse by the Executive Committee of the Southern Baptist Convention. The report shows some grieving findings and cost almost $2 million to complete. According to a Christianity Today article that gives an overview of the 288-page report, armed with a secret list of more than 700 abusive pastors, Southern Baptist leaders chose to protect the denomination from lawsuits rather than protect the people in their churches from further abuse. The Executive Committee's General Counsel said that effort to advocate for its sexual abuse survivors was a satanic scheme to completely distract us from evangelism. An article from Christian Headlines points out that SBC leaders responded to sex abuse claims with resistance, stonewalling, and outright hostility. Survivors were shunned, discredited, insulted, and were made to feel as though they had no value. Sadly, many leaders aligned themselves with the accused, and proven perpetrators, and even helped them personally. In addition, the report also highlights many of the sexual assault and abuse allegations against people such as former denomination and seminary presidents. This largest investigation in denomination history was overwhelmingly approved by a vote of the messengers at last year's annual meeting. There are many recommendations that the third-party investigation firm Guidepost Solutions said should be taken by the denomination to address these issues. According to the report from Christianity Today, they want the 13.7 million member denomination to create an online database of abusers, offer compensation for survivors, sharply limit non disclosure agreements, and establish a new entity dedicated to responding to abuse. There are additional recommended actions, but this highlights many of the reforms that survivors have been calling for all along. As one who has been a part of the SBC, I find this a very sad and grieving report. I have touched on subjects such as how to deal with the failures of our leaders in the past and how to handle them. In another recent video, I addressed the subject of secret sins and what to do about that. I would encourage you to watch both of those videos as they are relevant to this situation. Today, I want to see what the Bible can teach us to help us consider the implications of the situation and learn what our response should be. Sexual sins of this type are sinful in the eyes of the Lord. This is seen in Ephesians 5.3. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness 
must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. We also see in 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sinned against his own body. It is also sinful to cover up the sins of others, especially for one in the position of authority in the church. 1 Timothy 5.20 tells us this, that those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove before everyone, so that the others may take warning. Since these actions are sinful and illegal, they should have had protections and accountability procedures in place to avoid these issues and help victims. God wants us to obey the law, so they certainly should have been reporting these instances as the law requires. As disappointing as this is, we should not just hear this news and be indifferent to the sin in our own lives. We might not all struggle with lust or other forms of sexual sin, but this does not make us any less guilty or susceptible of other sins. Situations like this should drive us all to seek holiness so we do not fall into temptation ourselves. How can you resist temptation? There is a lot that can be said to answer that question, but I want to highlight a few verses. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This verse shows us that if we submit ourselves to God and obey his commands, that will give us a powerful tool to help us resist the temptations of the devil. Jesus gave his disciples this part of advice. Matthew 26, 41 says, Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. This teaches us that to resist temptation, we should be on the lookout and spend time in prayer. We don't have the strength within ourselves to resist temptation, even though that might be our desire. We need to pray for God to give us the strength to resist temptation. At the same time, God gives us this promise. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. As believers, God promises that we can overcome temptation and find a path of escape. This is because Jesus was able to overcome temptation even though he suffered. As a result, he can help us overcome temptation when, it, when we are faced with it. Therefore we are told in Hebrews 2.18, For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Scripture makes it clear that even though it is difficult to overcome temptation, he has equipped us with the appropriate tools to do so. Now I want to briefly focus on pursuing personal holiness. The Bible shows us that holiness is also important. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Look also at Hebrews 12 14. Strive for peace with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. One of the reasons that we should be holy is because God is holy. For example, look at 1 Peter 1, 
If the seer called you as holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. When the Bible says that God is holy, it refers to his absolute perfection that separates him from his creation. He is completely without sin and greater than any other thing or any other being. The entirety of his being and all of his attributes is defined by holiness. These are the kinds of characteristics that we should emulate. We might not be able to completely be perfect, but it is our job to be set apart from the world to live for him. Our lives should appear distinct when compared to the world because we are chasing after God's standards and not those of the world. As important as it is for us to chase after holiness and avoid temptation personally, this can also be applied to the SBC. There are still some good SBC churches out there, but there is this trend in the SBC to shun holiness and righteousness and instead focus on popularity entertainment, and the latest culturally relevant fad. They sometimes even focus on evangelism at the expense of other things that they should be doing. If they would put more emphasis on holiness and righteousness living, instead of seeing standing up against sexual abuse as a distraction to evangelism, it would probably help them avoid some of these issues in the future. Unfortunately, this is a common trend even in churches outside of the SBC. I hope that the SBC sees the importance of these recommended changes and how holiness can help them recover a right perspective and improve their response to sexual abuse. As it is, this report is a big stain not just on the SBC, but on the church as a whole. This is not a good look, and it might, in fact, become a stumbling block to some who do not believe. This has a much greater impact on evangelism than if they had stood up against this in the first place. Now, I want to introduce a new segment, Church Invasion. In this segment, I want to look at ways that the culture has invaded the church and see what we might be able to do about it. Today, I want to respond to some concerning trends in the church. I recently came across a CBN News article titled, Death of a Biblical Worldview in America. Most parents of young children don't believe in Jesus for salvation. This is according to research by Dr. George Barna at Arizona Christian University's Cultural Research Center. Dr. Barna is concerned about this trend as the research shows that while 67% of American parents with preteens identify as Christian, only 2% possess a biblical worldview. Dr. Barna understands this to mean that most parents will not go to heaven when they die. Since most people die with the worldview they had at age 13, this makes it clear that Christian parents are not doing enough to instruct their children in the ways of the Lord. The article shows that one of the most important things we learned about parents with preteens is that they don't believe the Bible is reliable or true or relevant to their lives, said Dr. Varna. They don't have the same view of God as given to us in the Bible. Five out of six of them are not born again Christians, meaning they believe when they die and go to heaven, but only because they confess their sins and accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. In a culture that only exists to satisfy and that encourages people to do what they want, this is a sad but not very surprising trend. 
This is believed to be a result of things like no-fault divorce, as well as the secularization of news, art, and entertainment. It adds that public schools and government laws foster a culture where wisdom and biblical truth have little room to grow. Sadly, I don't think the causes listed in this article are the only things to blame. A recent article from the Christian Post is titled, Study Finds 37% of Pastors Have Biblical Worldview, Spiritual Awakening Needed in Our Pulpits. As shocking as the last article was, this one is even more so. This study is sourced from the same cultural research center at Arizona Christian University. The remaining 62% of pastors hold to a syncretistic worldview, which is defined as the blending of ideas and applications from a variety of holistic worldviews into a unique but inconsistent combination that represents their personal preferences. The article reported that the study showed that 41% of senior pastors, as compared to 28% of associate pastors, have a biblical worldview. Further, only 13% of teaching pastors and 12% of children's and youth pastors have a biblical worldview. The lowest level of biblical worldview was among executive pastors, with only 4% of them holding consistently biblical beliefs and behaviors. Both of these trends clearly show that the culture is invading the church. As Christians, we are to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Just look at Matthew 5 verses 13 through 14. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. If church members and even pastors are compromised by the culture, then it is no wonder that the church has lost its effectiveness in the culture. The culture is a dangerous foe, and we must be ready to stand against it. If we just sit around and let it invade our minds and our churches, then it will win. The Bible makes it clear that the things that we desire in this world are not from the Father, and they're ultimately going to pass away. Just look at 1 John 2 verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. We'll see something similar in Matthew 6.21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If our treasure is in this world, then that is where our heart is going to be. It is not always easy to treasure the right things, but we must be careful to do so. There are times it is easy to treasure our possessions or our life experiences more than the things of the Lord. God wants us to value His Word, prayer, obedience, our salvation, and holiness. The Bible tells us that we are blessed if we avoid the ways of the world and instead delight in God's law. Psalms 1 verses 1 through 2 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. In previous videos, we have seen that our hearts cannot be trusted. 
This is why the Bible tells us to guard our hearts and our souls. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Look also at Deuteronomy 4 verses 9 through 10. Only take care and keep your soul diligently. Lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. How on the day that you stood before the Lord, your God at Horeb, the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me that I may let them hear my word so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children so. Both of these verses show us that we need to be vigilant and diligent to keep the commands of the Lord so we learn to fear God and live for Him. This should even be passed down to our children so they can maintain a proper worldview that is built on the foundation of God's Word. God knows our hearts better than we do, and He can correct and cleanse our grievous sins and lead us in the way He wants us to live. Psalm 139 verses 23 through 24 says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Look also at 1 John verse, uh, chapter 1 verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus the Son cleanses us from all sin. God wants the way that we serve Him to be pure and unstained from the world. James 1.27 says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. How can we accomplish this and make sure we are obeying the Lord? Well, it is important to make sure our thoughts are in the right place. If you know the truth, this will help you defend against the opinions and arguments of the world and even our minds. We must rid ourselves of human and worldly wisdom to be freed from their captivity and instead put our thoughts in that captivity to Christ. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 5 through 6 says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. The last verse in this passage shows us that it is important to be under leadership that is willing to punish disobedience. If your pastors and church leaders do not have a biblical worldview, they are not going to rebuke the sins of the people and encourage obedience. Another verse that shows us the type of teaching Christians need is 2 John 1 verses 9 to 11. Everyone who goes ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching is both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. Whoever greets him takes part in his wicked ways. With so many pastors who are not abiding in the full teachings of Christ, we would be wise to heed the words of Scripture and avoid those who do not teach the Bible, so we do not take part in their wickedness and lack of a biblical worldview. If you are a pastor and you are struggling with your worldview, pray that God would break the patterns of disobedience and help you stop trying to make scripture agree with worldly ideas. Pastors also need to keep their hearts in line with scripture, cleanse their hearts, and obey the ways of the Lord. 
pastors have a great amount of influence over their congregants. Typically, the members of the church are going to follow the message and example of their pastors. If the hearts of pastors aren't right with God, then neither will the hearts of their congregants be right with God. This is a crisis that we, as Christians, need to fight against. We need to pray for our leaders and our families, so we can stay loyal to God and develop a proper worldview based on Scripture. We must obey the Lord instead of the world. Psalm 4 verse 3 says, But know that the Lord is set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. We encourage to set your life apart from the Lord and not be swayed by the culture that so desperately wants our attention. How does this video challenge your life and worldview? Please let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Be sure this video with your friends to expand the reach of this ministry. Thanks for watching, and until next time, what in the truth?